Welcome back for another episode of Engineering Roundtable. I'm Nick and we are getting ready to start a project that I've been wanting to tackle for a while now. We're going to build a pinball machine and I'm going to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about pinball machines so before I jump into this project I thought I better do some research. So we're going to check out Lions Classic Pinball in Lions, Colorado. They've got over 30 pinball machines and the guy should know a thing or two about pinball so let's find out what he knows. Hey guys, we're here at uh, Lions Classic Pinball and I'm talking to Kevin Carroll who owns this incredible collection of pinball machines and runs this pinball joint. So uh, I'm going to ask him a few questions about uh, pinball machines. Cool. Thanks for talking to us today. No problem. Um, so how do you end up with a collection like this of so many <laughs> machines? Uh, years ago my wife bought me a pinball machine for a birthday present, blew me away. Took it down the basement with our other ping pong and things like that. Yeah. Eventually we got so addicted to it, everything else had to go. Basement filled up with pinballs. I wanted more. I said, hey, let's open up a shop. So this isn't your whole collection here at Lions Classic. You've no. got more machines at home? Oh, yeah. How many machines do you think you have? We counted just recently. Uh, we topped out at probably about 190. <sighs> and uh, decided that we were need to sell off some games. So really, uh, <laughs> literally sold about 10 games in the past uh, two, three months, which is huge wow. for me. I noticed that there are different kinds of pinball machines. There are electromechanical machines and there are solid state machines. Right. And it all has to do with what technology yeah. they're using and, and usually what era they're from, I yeah. guess. Yeah. An example would be this game right here, El Dorado. You know, that game has about five, it's five other games have that same play field. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cheating. They're just using the same play field on a thing. And the reality was that's a single player. As a single player game, it's different than a two player or a four player because in the old school games, they don't have a brain. They really can't remember. So when you knock down a target, if you've got a two player game, you knock down a few targets, you drain the ball, boom, they start over again for the next guy. So in between balls, everything's going to start over again. It gotcha. has no memory of what happened, only what points you got. And in the head, too, you've got score reels in the old school ones where you see you've got solenoids in there and contraptions and wheels, and the thing is heavy and full. So a four-player game costs more than a single-player game. As sure. soon as you got to solid state, it's a bunch of yeah, it's little glasses on there. They're all going to be four-player games. And then, then you moved on to alphanumeric after solid state where you're able to scroll things, scroll words, and, and, oh, sure. and put in scores. And then right after that, you got uh, Dot Matrix. And in the Dot Matrix, you got a full screen where you can have cartoons, play video games, do everything else that's going on, and you can always be a four-player game. In fact, a game like that, I think you can go six players. So there's all kinds of um, play field components in pinball machines. There's like drop targets and um, pop bumpers and all sorts of slingshots and things like that. Um, are there some that are just like a classic thing that all pinball machines have to have? I mean, you usually see pop bumpers. Yeah, you, you pretty much name the three components that most pinball machines have. Gotcha. I mean, some have one pop bumper and an unusual game would have no pop bumpers, but they've made them. There's one called Fire I had. It has a bunch of slingshots, so there ah. are things to kick the ball around, gotcha. but no specific pop bumper. Uh, but most of them have pop bumper and, and nowadays a standard set of three because it causes a lot of action to go on in them to hold the ball in a certain area for a certain amount of time. Uh, but yeah, and then flippers, obviously, uh, I mean, but that wasn't always a component, believe it or not. Before 1947, flippers didn't exist. So really? I have games in my living room from 1932 that you just plunge the ball and nudge. And they're also completely mechanical. These mechanical games, you know, have no flippers at all. Then in 47, you got the flipper, and people were blown away that you could move the ball around inside. Oh, right. You know, and, and in fact, they were... Game over, man! Game over! They were not standard. They were six flippers on the original game, and they went backwards all the way up the play field. They were all controlled by the same solenoid, so they were very weak. Oh, wow, yeah. So you could just push it maybe up to the next flipper, and then uh, maybe push it again, and people were thrilled by that. So 
after that, every game, even old games, got retrofitted with flippers. Sure. I'd like to see what that looks like All inside right. some of these machines. Let's get into one. The end of the electromechanical era is like 77, 78 is when yeah. they changed. And uh, so this one's 75. So it was kind of like at the top of the, you know, lots going on, even though it doesn't look like lots is going on. This is the brain. Wow. You notice there's not like a whole lot of toys on the top of this game yet. All yeah. that is necessary for, you know, the basic things that it does do. All these uh, coils down here are relays for like scorekeeping. As you hit things on the play field, you're going to close a switch. Mm -hmm. That switch is worth a certain amount of points. And it also, in conjunction with other switches, say you get A, B, C on something and then turn on another switch. Oh, and wow. we're talking just a million different relays to get to close something, to turn a light on, to make a score reel move. We talk to people about when they buy a, a, an electromechanical machine, that the switches, if you use the machine, is your best chance of it to keep working because they're self-cleaning. Got a switch gotcha. like this, and as you use it, it swipes. And as it swipes, it cleans. So if it sits in grandma's basement for a year and everyone comes at Christmas to play the game, oxidization, dirt, all kinds of stuff, this thing hasn't been self-cleaning, it ain't gonna work. Which yeah. switch is not working? Who knows, and that's <laughs> the problem. I can open up uh, KISS a few years later and just show you what the inside of a of early solid state was like. So now we see nothing, pretty much emptied out. Now the bottoms of the play fields are similar. You know, they still need all the solenoids and all the, uh, some switches to open gates and close gates and things like that. So now in general, you just see a little more hardware on the bottom of the game because of all the things that have to happen on the top of the game. It's still empty and there's still just boards in the back. In an old school game, there's three boards in the head, the CPU, the driver boards, and maybe the sound card. They each had their own chips in them. So like a certain series of games, all the KISS games would have like, you get the next chip for the Dolly game. Now that technology is so outdated and hard to fix, hard to find certain chips at times that people have come up with their own boards. So like there's one called the Ultimate MPU for Dallies and Sterns. Oh, gotcha. Where you just buy this little board, throw the switches to what game you have out of like 160 games, put it in, everything's good again, and we got new technology so that that nice. game works. Don't know where you're going with your machine, but that ought to be interesting. I don't either quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for having us out here. Uh, this place is awesome. Lions Classic Pinball in Lions, Colorado. And they've got so many pinball machines here. And I'm about to try my skill at a few of them. Cool. Come play. Okay, so now that we know a little bit more about pinball machines, I think we're ready to go ahead and get into this project. So we're going to probably throw a couple of pop bumpers in there. We're going to throw a couple of uh, stand-up targets. And it should be a really cool machine. Uh, most pinball machines have a theme. I figured it would only be fitting to do a SparkFun themed pinball machine, sort of representing all the different departments at SparkFun and some SparkFun type events. Maybe I'll have an AVC themed part of the game or an inventory day part of the game. I don't know. Um, so over the next couple of episodes, we're going to do this pinball machine piece by piece. In the next episode, hopefully, I'll have built the cabinet, the wooden enclosure part of the pinball machine, and I'll be able to get started on the actual play field, which is where the ball runs around and does its thing. And then in the next video, hopefully, I'll have the control portion of the pinball machine sort of built up. I'll have a board that we designed that will actually control all of the bumpers and all of the scorekeeping and the sounds and lights and things like that, and the play field will be mostly complete and hopefully in just a few videos, so a few months, probably middle of summer, we'll have a working pinball machine. I'll be able to show you guys. And uh, so we're gonna learn a lot about solenoids and about sound control and light control and board layout and mechanics. There will be a lot of different subjects that go into building this pinball machine. So uh, stick with me and uh, we'll try to get through this. <laughs> On the next episode of Engineering Roundtable, we have a brand new addition to the Engineering Roundtable team, our very own Minister of Machines, Paul. So make sure to tune in and check that out, and I will see you guys next time on Engineering Roundtable.